What's going on, y'all? This episode features booking agent, talent buyer, festival producer, and my good friend, Mr. Micah Davidson, CEO and founder of Midwood Entertainment. This is a really awesome conversation. We talk about all the different things that go into town buying, how to get a town buyer's attention or a venue's attention when you're trying to book an email, and how to get a booking agent. Micah gives very specific guidelines on real actual steps that people can follow to get a booking agent. This is episode number 102 of the podcast. To find the show notes and all that, the links are in the description of this video. And please share, subscribe, and leave a comment. I uh, would love to engage with you guys. love to know what you, what you thought. love to know if you have any questions. Uh, please use the comment section as a place where we can answer some questions for you. Thank you all for watching. Here is the interview with the amazing Micah Davidson. Live the life you love. A while ago, I did an agent series and... It was like all agents from like APA, Paradigm, UTA, and B Baron Ruth uh, gave me shit. And he's like, what about all the independent agents? And I'm like, man, like with all the DIY artists on the podcast, it actually makes a lot of sense. So you're actually the first uh, agent or I guess someone with, with agency experience from boutique agency. You obviously do much, much more than that. But yeah, you're the first one. Oh, cool. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited. I'm glad I got to beat Baron, especially since he was the one who was giving you shit about it. So, I know, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe this will motivate him to finally uh, get one of the books. <laughs> That's right. So um, I guess give everyone kind of like the elevator version of like what Midwood Entertainment is and what it is that you do currently. And then we'll go a little bit through your story and probably some of the things that we've talked about in the past and recent uh, weeks. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I mean, currently, like a lot of people, I'm sitting at my desk at home trying to, uh, you know, maintain a company. Um, a quick uh, elevator pitch, I guess, would be that we are a, um, a company has been around for about four and a half years, started mainly as an agency and was dabbling in some uh, uh, production and event coordination and such. And four and a half years later, we have four divisions. We have um, an agency division with uh, two agents and about 23 bands that they handle the touring for uh, nationally. Um, we have an event division, um, which is my true day-to-day, -day, besides running the whole company, is my true day-to-day -day purview, um, handling talent buying and festival production and festival consultation. And we do an average of 30 to 35 different festivals and concert series throughout the year, throughout the Southeast. Um, we have a marketing division um, where we handle digital marketing for festivals and, and events as well as uh, venues. Mm -hmm. And then we have a venue division and um, we have uh, six venues that we handle talent buying for internally inside Midwood Entertainment. And then we partner with a, another company called Mi uh, Max Music with two X's, um, a guy named Greg McCraw, who also lives here in Charlotte. And... Um, we help him handle buying for a lot of his venues as well. Um, and between the two entities, we have a total of about 27 venues, I think, between Pennsylvania and Florida that we either uh, produce shows in ourselves as self-promoters um, or, or outside promoters, or we um, handle the buying on behalf of the venue. Um, the relationships on the venue division are a little different depending on each, each specific venue's needs and desires and such. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of kind of where we're at at the moment. So, awesome. you know, yeah. Love it. It's a lot of, a lot of different areas. A lot of different hats. hats, yeah. A lot of well, different hats. One thing I've always wanted to ask you, and I actually never asked before, and we good for the podcast for, for the students that are listening, but there's some like agencies like, like you and like Madison House that do promote shows and even like manage artists. Are there mm -hmm. any like rules or restrictions to what, I guess, agencies can do to where it's maybe not double dipping or a conflict of interest for the artists? Well, so one thing, and, and I know that this is always sort of a, this is always sort of a thing that, that gets, it's, it's a, it's a, con, it's a constant question that, that not only do we battle with internally, but is, is always asked of us. And I, I think it's something that, that any agency such as this or a Madison house, you know, they have Madison house presents, obviously mm -hmm. any kind of agency that, that is multifaceted, I think gets this question a lot for us. We try and be very specific with, both our event clients as well as our agency clients. Mm -hmm. And we tell them if we're signing a band, we let them know, you know, listen, certainly we have all of these events that we do, but we want to make it very clear that at the end of the day, you may never play a single one of our events. And, and it's not that we don't try and offer those opportunities to our, 
you know, to our agent clients. That's part of the reason why we do it for sure. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we know what does, what that artist is worth and we know what that artist would like to have financially, you know, um, and, and maybe artists don't like me saying these kind of things and stuff. And now they're going (laughs) to hear it live out in the world. But the reality is, is that we, we, we know what is ultimately best for you and what is the experience that, that you need to have as an artist. And sometimes that's not always going to match up with a specific event, no matter how much the artist may think that. Mm-hmm. And on the reverse side of that, a client's needs um, on the event side are the exact same. You think about the strategy of that. What is most important for that client's needs, just like what is most important for in, uh, an artist's needs mm-hmm. um, from that standpoint. And, you know, it, it, a, an event client, at the end of the day, the goal is to continue to try and help them grow their events, sell more tickets. Um, if it's a free show, just have a, a, the most curated lineup that will still draw as many people because we all know that even a free show doesn't necessarily mean that people will come to the show. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it still has to be the right lineup. And, and there are times where no matter how badly um, an artist may want to play on that event, it may be that at the end of the day, that event, you know, one of our uh, events may be strictly bluegrass and it may be so bluegrass that a country artist doesn't make sense to be on it, right. mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, and you have that conversation constantly with those people. We have one of our festivals, the North Carolina Brewers and Music Festival, which would have celebrated its 10th year uh, this year. We've gone ahead and punted it to 2021, but it's a, it's a jam grass, bluegrass festival. Mm-hmm. And so our bands that are based in New Orleans don't make any sense for it, right? you know? So having those conversations, we have to look at it from both sides of the coin. Um, and it's a constant, you know, it's a constant battle on that, on, on that front, but it's at the end of the day, we still have to try and do what's right for, um, each one of our clients. And one thing I'll say uh, about that is we try and, and, and live with as much honesty in these discussions with as much honesty, um, as possible. At the end of the day, we work for all of these people, whether we, right. it, we represent the band, we represent, you know, the event, whatever it might be. And they need as much information as possible. So if a buyer doesn't want them, if we don't think they make sense for the event, you know, so on and so on, we're going to help them develop a strategy that's going to help them succeed and and try and not have them focus on the things that ultimately don't make sense for them, you know, in the long run and such. And they may not like to hear that, but at the end of the day, they're going to have the honest answer. So, I mean, that's the most important part. I think when, when it comes to building good, solid relationships, it's just having these conversations up front and, and being honest and transparent. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you talked about punting the the festival, the Brewers Festival, to 2021. Right. So mm-hmm. whenever people are listening to this, if they're listening to this in 10 years from now, uh, t- today as of this recording, we're dealing with the, the COVID-19 virus, which you and I have talked about a lot. But I guess yep. kind of share everybody, with everyone how that's affected you and how you're doing business and maybe potential outlooks for, for the future. Um, I know some people are saying we're not going to do shows until fall next year. Um, you, I know you have put shows on the books for fall this year of 2020. Um, yeah. How's that affected you and what do you think the future outlooks like? Um, the future is hard to be able to really truly give much of an outlook. Um, in my personal opinion, I think it's going to be difficult for us to be doing any kind of, uh, mass gatherings, um, between now and the end of the year, for sure. I think Mm -hmm. in general, until there's a, a true vaccine, um, you know, or an immunity to this particular disease that, um, keeping things closed um, and not putting people at risk, whether they like it or not, not putting people at risk in the long run is going to be the best thing. Um, mm-hmm. If we open this up too early, people start to get sick again. Um, yeah. You know, it, that means we have to shut back down where we could have stayed closed for longer um, and, and, and ultimately kept people safer for longer and mm-hmm. all of that until there was an immunity to this. Um, that said, the way it's affected us is, uh, you know, on the agency side, like a lot of agencies out there, big and small, and everything in between, we've had to cancel every gig between middle of March through the end of June. And it looks like we're starting to probably start to have the same tactic for July, maybe moving into August. Um, uh, some of our agents who work for us are, are rescheduling things for the, the third and sometimes, excuse me, the third and sometimes even fourth time um, sure. moving forward, you know, um, for festivals and events and, and the event side of things, we are, um, we haven't, we've, we've only, as of now, we've only canceled 
uh, we've, we've canceled two festivals and we have canceled one concert series. Mm -hmm. um, out of those three events that have actually been truly affected or the series and such that have been affected, we have just postponed the North Carolina Brewers and Music Festival to um, the same weekend of 2021. Instead, it's always Mother's Day weekend every year. Um, and we moved that to 2021. We were able to go ahead and rebook all but one of the artists who were performing art it. Um, and we've already filled that remaining slot as well for 2021's festival. But, uh, um, you know, and, and the rest of things, we're just sort of waiting and seeing like everybody else is, you know, yeah. when mm -hmm. government give us some mandates and such. Well, all the, the venues that you work with, they're mostly like smaller venues, like under 400 cap or? They vary. Um, I would say they're probably closer. The majority, as far as on my true day-to-day -day desk, mm -hmm. my venues are more 250 or lower. Okay. Um, as far as company-wide, we have venues that go up to about 2,500 cap um, mm -hmm. and lower. We have access to a couple of coliseums. Haven't honestly used them yet, but we do have access to to them where we could do um, eight to 10,000 people um, oh, nice. in, in, in some of those spaces. But um, our normal day to day, I would say, is 2,500 and 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 lower. Our smallest venue that we work with is 133 cap. Um, it's called the Attic. It's down in Tampa. That is one that follows under my day to day purview, and it's a really cool space because um, even though it's small, we tend to do much bigger shows, and they're almost all underplays, higher do dollar tickets um, and such. And you know, you can see a, a Shooter Jennings or a Mac McAnally or even JJ Gray doing a two day solo show. That's awesome you know, in this space and such. So it's, it's, it's a cool thing, but even then we've had to reschedule a lot of things. We're focusing on September and beyond at this point for 2020. Right. Well, hopefully that's all done and over soon, but um, we, we could probably spend all day talking about this stuff and you and I have talked a lot about it. I want to oh, yeah. talk a little more about, about your journey and then kind of throw in some lessons for people when it comes to agents and booking shows with town buyers and so on. So I guess okay. let's start off. You, you started off in a band too. So tell me about your, experience playing in bands and like how much did you play like, did you play mostly locally regionally did you actually full-on go on tours well you're you're uh, you, you really did some research there uh, even though we've been friends for years and years you, <laughs> you really reached back into the saddlebag there um, <laughs> um yeah i was in a band years ago I was in two different bands that did that did some touring um uh one was called the scott jeffries band and i would say that that was a three-year lesson in how not to tour <laughs> um, it was a three year lesson in how to make a, a quick living with it, but it was, it was very much a, a, a long term lesson of, of how not to actually properly tour as an artist um, and as someone who was hoping to grow a fan base. Um, Scott Jeffrey's band was very much, ba we, almost every gig we played, we had to bring in our own PA. They were really more in bars that were having, you know, were having music and such, and you never really build a fan base. Even though we were selling CDs, you never really built a fan base that way. We never got management. We never got marketing directors or publicists or anything like that to help with those things. It was probably very early on before there was really any real social media and such, but still. Mm -hmm. um, then I was in a band called Dead End Parking for a couple of years, and uh, I'm a bass player. Um, paid, played bass for, for both of those bands, and uh, Dead End Parking played smarter, not harder. We toured, uh, Scott Jeffers Band toured the country. Um, and again, we still played the majority of the, I would say 75 to 85% of the venues we played were not real venues. Mm -hmm. They were bars. Um, dead end parking stuck around more to the Southeast and, um, did more actual concert venues. We would play places where your show is totally based on ticket sales. You know, um, you have to do a lot of marketing to get people to come out to the shows, um, try and you know negotiate opening slots at bigger venues and things like that to try and build a fan base. And so we didn't play as often, and we certainly, unfortunately, we didn't stick. We, you know, we weren't a band long enough to actually truly make a living off of it either. But we, I, I learned again in Scott Jarvis Band how not to tour, um, and 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 all the things that you shouldn't be doing. And then in Dead End Parking, I learned more about how to properly tour. Mm -hmm. um, but even when I was doing that, I was working for a venue here in town. Um, more as a catch-all grunt kind of thing called the Neighborhood Theater. Uh, there was a guy named Zach McNabb who was still in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. He owns a, a management company called Zally Presents who manages Talk um, mm -hmm. um, and Consider the Source and a few others. Um, he's a great, great, great guy and he taught me a lot. Um, but when I was working for the Neighborhood Theater, I was doing security, helping bands load in and load out, um, you know, uh, working the ticket booth, 
um, learning more about the true overall operations of how to run a venue um, mm -hmm. and such, and what are those different things you need to think about. And so I also learned then, got advice from Zach about how does a band tour and stuff like that and so on. Um, and that was before I started doing talent buying. What are so. some of the things uh, not to do since you learned a lot what not to do when touring? Um, well, I would definitely say things not to do is don't rely on your art to be what makes you a living. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, which is something I read from, uh, I think it's Elizabeth Gilbert um, is her name, um, wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Um, she, mm -hmm. she asked, that's a quote from her. Um, sorry if I misquoted her name, but <laughs> the author of that book. Um, the, uh, what we were trying to do constantly was forcing making a living playing music. And so we were playing at every place that would let us play music. But at the end of the day, we were, we were also playing, you know, we were doing 300 shows a year. Wow. The average band that tours now is like a hundred, somewhere between 80 to 120 shows. Wow. <laughs> we were doing 300 shows a year That's and insane. you're constantly tired you're not playing in the right kind of places because you're also you're always just chasing money and yeah all bands technically just chase money but they are you know constantly this was a situation where it was this bar will pay us five hundred dollars this bar will pay us a thousand dollars you know we weren't really playing any private events because we weren't building a fan base mm -hmm. um, we weren't really selling tickets so we couldn't get our, our financial numbers to go up again we constantly had to bring our own pa into almost every single place and 300 shows a year for three years that's a lot of wear and tear on a body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we strategize now about how, or we taught when we strategize with our bands. Now we, we constantly are telling them, you know, you're based on the East coast. Why do you want to go West coast? Besides the fact that you just want to go West coast, what's the strategy right. behind it? Right. And a lot of times you'll see a band try and tour all the way across the country. And, and by the time they come home, they're not even a band anymore. They hate mm -hmm. each other and all of that yeah. because there were no, there was no ticket sales, right. you know, they, they didn't make any money, you know, so on and so on. In the reverse of that, by by playing 300 shows a year to packed houses of people who didn't give a shit, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people who were drunk would constantly request covers. We were really very much more of a bar band. Even when we when we would play, the majority of a show would be original music, and we'd be selling CDs and such from time to time. We weren't. It was we were still playing in the in the kind of places where we were very much still background. You know, we were we were there for people who were drunk to have a good time and party. Um, and and that's not the way to be you want to be in a venue you want to be in an environment where people are there to to gravitate towards your music specifically mm -hmm. um you know and 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 hopefully grow your band and sell tickets and gain a fan base and stuff and so we did none of that <laughs> so, so like knowing what you know today i mean yeah like most of your bands are already like probably touring a little bit before they sign with you they already are making some money but if you're just starting out with a band um or you Maybe we're at a point, I've been playing with a band for a couple of years, but we don't really have an agent yet. It's nothing serious. At what point should bands start, one, playing outside of their hometown and then like across the country? Or does it even make sense to, to cross the country for like a young band? Well, I think it depends. It's, it's hard to sort of put one formula in place for any particular situation. I think if there was a true formula to it, everybody would be using that sure. same formula. Um, so, I mean, to some extent, and, and, and I, I hate to sort of be – take the responsibility off of an agent or a publicist or a manager or whatever. But at the end of the day, either you're kind of band that, that fans gravitate towards, or they don't, you could right. take bands that sound almost two bands that sound almost, almost identical and one band blows up and the other band shrivels and dies. Mm -hmm. And there's no real reason for it. You know, there's no rhyme or reason for it. And it's, so it's really kind of a luck of the draw situation for sure. That said, um, you know, things that a band should be, should be thinking about is, Number one, do they treat themselves as a business? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is. The bigger the artist gets, the more people they're going to have to put on payroll and the more merchandise they're going to have and the, where are they going to store that merchandise? They have to have a warehouse. How are they going to tour? How do you pay for a bus? How do you buy a bus? How do you know that you've grown to a point where you deserve a bus? You know, all of those have to do with running fundamental P&Ls, mm -hmm. you know, which is a profit and loss statement for those of you who don't know what a P&L is. Um, but when we go to talk to an artist who has never had an agent before, we certainly want to enjoy their music. You know, that's first and foremost, as, as someone who's looking to sign an artist, you know, or even a talent buyer for that matter, you know, do I even think this band is, is, is good? Right. Do I like them? Is it something I can get passionate about? 
But past that, we want to see that you're running your, your, your band as a business. We want to see that you are keeping track of ticket sales. We want to keep, see that you are keeping track of um, what your guarantees were in any particular markets. Are there notes from those from that the last two or three times you played at a specific venue? You know, did you sell the place out even though there was a blizzard? You know, mm -hmm. did you uh, did you not sell any tickets because there was a blizzard? Did you have did you sell a hundred pre-sale tickets but no walk-ups because there was a blizzard? You know, are you keeping track of all of these things mm -hmm. that help us? And, and break them down into a true spreadsheet. You know, take a take a spreadsheet, break it down as an as an annual, so by year, mm -hmm. and then break it down by month, and go ahead and tally up each one of those months individually, and then have them go to a cover sheet that shows this is what your band is grossing on an annual basis. You know, right. show us that you are running it as a business, because at the end of the day, we're going to help you build a format and a strategy that has to do with growing that business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are things that that. Are forgot those are things that are forgotten about with a lot of smaller bands is they don't everybody wants to be in a band everybody wants to make a living playing music but at the end of the day if this is going to be your job then it has to be run as a business right we do have guidelines for 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 artists and we use these you know not all the time but you know we, we try to to look at an artist and 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 that that's one of the big guidelines that we put in there is is we want to be able to see you know some kind of actual tour history that we can look at financial tour history Sure. So since you're talking about that being one of the things that you look at from artists, what else do you look at? I mean, because I've asked a lot of agents, like, what do you look for in an artist? And a lot of them say, oh, it's all about the music. But there are some definitely some tangible items that will get an agent's attention. So like, like keeping track of everything on a spreadsheet, making sure it's all organized and run as a business. But then when you look at that spreadsheet, what are some things you're looking for? Like, is there maybe a certain number of merch sales per year that get your attention or maybe how much an artist made per year or through social, through social media stats. So those matter. Like what, what other things and factors that you look at? We look at all of that stuff, you know, um, we sort of, uh, you know, at the end of the day, again, we're, we're trying to figure out, is there something we can, we can help you build off of? Is there hmm. at, at the, in the agent's job, good, bad, or ugly, they are just a salesman. Right. And this is the product that they get to sell. And I'm not saying that to take the emotional aspect of how we feel about music as music lovers, but at the end of the day, this is a business. And mm -hmm. our goal is to, is to take your product and have it become more of a profitable product. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so we want to look at your social media as, you know, how, how engaged are your fans? How often right. are you engaging your fans? Right. What is your, how much content do you have on your social media? Um, you know, what are the platforms where your fans are, are gravitating towards? Are you, um, are you offering different, are you using those social medias to your benefit, such as things like Instagram takeovers? You know, are you offering contests, ticket giveaways, merch giveaways, those kind of things? Um, you know, but also again, like when we look at the numbers of things, you've played at, uh, let's say the Hamilton in Washington, DC you've played there. I see on your tour history, you played there three times over the past two years. The first time you played there, you had, you, you sold 40 tickets. The next time you played there, you sold 80 tickets. The next time you played there, you sold 500 tickets. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the reasons for all of that? We want to look at that, you know, or the first time you played there in reverse, you sold 500 tickets. Right. And then every other time past that, you've sold less and less and less and less mm -hmm. tickets. What are the reasons behind that? Um, this is a small industry where people can reach each other very quickly. When we're talking with an artist, we will absolutely call promoters that we can, that we know that they've worked with and, and ask them how, how it's working with this band, you know, right. um, a big lesson. This is not something that I would say is necessarily when we're talking to an artist about signing them, this is not something that we usually bring up, but I'll go ahead and say this when we, we bring it up, once we get to a point where we truly are actually signing them, where we're, we're in the active stage of signing an artist, not just in discussion, um, this is when this gets brought up. But bands, and honestly, everybody in the world, sure, you know, we should all not be dicks to each other, right? you know. Yep. Well, but a band specifically, at the end of the day, they can fire their agent, they can fire their manager, they can fire their publicist, they can't fire the talent buyer. Right. Yeah. So if they show up to a venue... And they're not professional. They show up super late all the time. They constantly have attitude. At the end of the night when they're doing settlement, if there's a disagreement, they, be, they become unhinged and all of those things and they treat the buyers like crap. 
they'll never, it doesn't matter how many tickets they've sold, they'll never get by, invited back. Yeah. So I would always say that, that you 100% want to make sure that as an artist, you are always gracious to your buyers. You are always gracious to, um, to the crew in the house and all of that. And at the end of the day, you tell them, you know what, listen, this, you know, it, this map doesn't add up for me or this issue. I'm, I'm not 100% clear on, but you know what? We've had a really great time tonight. Thanks so much for even hosting us. I'll talk with my agent. I'll have him reach back out to you next week. You know, and you guys can resolve it and then let us be the jerks. Right. You know, um, because if you fire us, then at least that buyer wants to bring you back. Hmm. Um, I would also say something else. Uh, I love pointing this out because they're the only, they're the first band who did it. Um, and I think to this day, they're still the only band who's done it, but uh, front country who I love dearly. Hmm. We don't work with They're over at uh, they're with Baron Ruth over <laughs> at the crossover touring. Um, every single show I've ever done with that band, I get a personal email after the fact. Mm -hmm. Every show I've ever done with that band, I've done through an agent. Mm -hmm. And every single time, the, almost the Monday or Tuesday, like clockwork, after the show happens, I will get an email from the band with a simple thank you so much for continuing to support us and to have us at your whatever event, whatever venue it might have been. And certainly I've built a personal relationship with, with the, the folks in that band for sure, you know, but, um, you know, Jacob Groupman, who's the band leader, him and Melody, I, I get an email from them. Maria. I can't hear you. I can see your mouth moving, but I can't hear what you're saying. Can you hear me? I can hear you then. Can you hear me now? Oh, oh there you are. Okay. Man, I just, this mixer that I'm using, this is the second time where it, it kind of crapped out. Oh. Weird. I mean, it's still through the, through the, the Zoom session. So, okay. I'm going to. I was having really good audio. <laughs> we're great. Um, okay. so, we're, so we were saying about um, talking about how they, um, the band leader and someone else, they always follow up with you. Yeah, they always follow up and just send a gracious thank you note, you know. Um, and those kind of little details will make me want to work with that band more often. You Absolutely. know, there are some bands um, who every time I've worked with them, and it's only been two or three times. There's one band in particular who I'm not going to name, but it, those who may be listening to this, who actually know who I am, they will probably know exactly who I'm talking about. But this particular band is a pain in the ass and they become, it's become apparently obvious that they're a pain in the ass because they feel like they can be, mm -hmm. you know, the things that they're a pain in the ass, they don't advance. You know, they show up and say, well, we never got an advance. Well, there was four or five attempts through phone you know, phone calls, emails, Facebook messages, all of this stuff, you know, oh, sorry, we just read our advance today. You know, no, we can't do this. No, we can't do that. You know, all of this stuff, so on and so on. And why do I want to work with them? There's, there's millions of bands out there and a lot of them are extremely talented. Mm -hmm. And I can find a band who is willing to play ball and is willing to, look, there are going to be needs that an artist has. So I'm not saying it like we don't want to play ball with them as well. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if everybody's easy to work with and everybody's gracious and stuff like that, I'm going to want to work with you more and more. Yeah, absolutely. So crazy. That's only one artist has actually reached out to you consistently to say, thank you. And I mean, yeah. I mean, same, same boat here. I mean, people never really reach out after the fact and say, thank you. Uh, even friends. I mean, I have tons of artists I'm friends with and I just recently did a show with, you know, one that's been a friend for like a decade uh, and a couple of locals and one out of the three reached out and said like, thank you for, for having me on the show. And, um yeah so they really appreciate it it's just so crazy that no one says thank you it's such a like thankless industry sometimes very much so yeah and, and that's and that's fine i'm not saying it like as a complaint necessarily but when you you asked about you know what are things that bands can be mindful of mm -hmm. and, such, and things like that like again if i call a promoter if we're talking if we're talking with a band not even actively signing but if we're talking with a band and we're doing our due diligence we're looking at their numbers we're looking at their music we're looking at their social numbers we're looking at their you know, activity and their engagement, but we're still going to talk, we're still going to call a buyer. There is a band that we were recently talking with about possibly signing mm -hmm. and financially it overall looked fine, but we called a few buyers and all we heard about how much of a jerk this particular artist is mm -hmm. that we said no, because it also reflects on us. We don't want to, there's no, we don't want to be selling that, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, when is the right time for a band to like reach out to 
an agent. So one of the things I always teach, and love to get your feedback on that, is even if you may not be ready completely, like you're not maybe touring 100 shows a year or making 100 grand a year, but you have something going on, at least like start reaching out to agents to introduce yourself, like not try to push yourself on and try to, hey, represent me, I need an agent. Like more just try to build a relationship and a friendship. But of course, there's only so many times you're gonna spend time answering an email from someone you don't know, um, not any personal, because you guys are just super busy. When is like the right time for an artist to reach out and start building that relationship with an agent? Um, I don't think there's ever a wrong time because you never really know what anybody's going through on a personal level. And, 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 and I say that even on a professional level, but I think you reach out and you ask questions. At the end of the day, again, don't be a jerk. If said agent or if said talent buyer, whoever is not reaching back out, don't continue to hit them up and bother them and bother them and bother them and, and be sort of a jerk about it. I, I will I will say that, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, this is just a, a general philosophy that was instilled in, in me from the moment I was born from my parents. Um, if someone, and, 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 and I was also an agent for years, I'm, I'm now really more of a talent buyer. So this also reigns, uh, uh, is something I'd like to harp on, but I answer every email. I don't care who it's from, you know, as long as it didn't, sh as long as it wasn't in my spam folder. So I actually found it, you know, I answer it. Um, and so I don't care when somebody reaches out, let them reach out. And at the end of the day, again, I've got some guidelines, you know, you mentioned the hundred thousand dollars a year. Some of those guidelines are, or to try and give people a realistic expectation of what an agent at any particular size is looking for. Right. I don't know what if Paradigm or William Morris or even Crossover or, or, or Intrepid or Nimble Slick have those guidelines or not, but I worked for an agency before I started this one and they had some guidelines in place and a lot of that is certainly to weed out people who aren't ready. Right. Uh, but I think it's good to have because again, it, it, it gives, it not only manages expectations, but it gives that artist a, a certain set of goals. You know, we look for two years of tour history, which we've talked about. We also look for an artist who's, who's, grossing roughly a hundred thousand dollars a year of, of actual touring not with merchandise or royalties or whatever just actual ticketing gigs um you know or festivals and such and then we also look for you know an average of them selling two to, to four hundred tickets hard tickets in their home market um and roughly 100 to 150 hard tickets in the eight most regional markets outside of their home um those are guidelines do we make them actual like hard requirements absolutely not right. sometimes we wave one of those guidelines sometimes we wave all those guidelines it just kind of depends but and, and fundamentally again we still want to be working with artists who we, we like the music and we like the the, the personalities in the in those bands but um but i think it's good when an artist reaches out to me because then i have to especially if they're reaching out as, as they're looking for an agent then i can say checked out your music it's really good here's some guidelines that we tend to look at and when somebody comes back to us and they're like, oh, well, we've only done four gigs our entire life. Mm -hmm. they, they produced an amazing EP that they're sharing with the world, but they've only done four gigs. Well, they're not ready. And this right. gives them some guidelines. From a talent buyer standpoint, there's, there's certainly less guidelines and requirements and stuff. I think at the end of the day, it has more to do with, you know, is this something that fits, you know? Um, and one thing I, I urge people to definitely not do um, is don't, don't scream and yell and holler at a buyer, even over email, um, because they're not hiring your band. You, I've been trying, you know, some artist reaches out, I've been trying to get on this festival or this concert series for, for years. And no matter who I talk to, I can't seem to get on it. Okay. Well, no offense. Right. I know this is personal, but maybe it's not the right festival for you. And maybe you should stop reaching out that, or just don't be beat up about it. Cause nobody's, nobody's not hiring you because you know, it could be timing. It could be we already have enough bluegrass bands, we have enough country artists, we have enough rock and roll, we have enough funk, whatever it might be. You know, there's always a reason why something isn't necessarily working out, and there's no reason for anybody to get upset about it on that level. Yeah, mm -hmm. those guidelines are great, and I'm glad that you shared those because it really gives an artist something to work towards, right? Exactly. You know, work towards, I think, as you said, some of those guidelines get waved sometimes. So if you really enjoy the music and you've seen growth in those, I would say like. Focus on eight to 10 markets when you're first starting out. Build those markets. You want to be able to sell out the two to 400 person venue in your hometown. Right. Then be able to sell another 100 to 200 tickets in those eight markets around you. And if you can even do that, like even if it's not $100,000 yet, 
um, that'll get most agents' attention. And especially if your music's really good, because um, then they see like there's a good, solid foundation there. It's something that you can build off of, especially if you've been doing it for, for two years. Correct. That's great to have. Um, yeah. When they reach out to you from an agent side and a buyer side, what should that email look like? Like, what are some email pet peeves? Like, what gets an automatic delete? Um, I'm sure someone writes you a novel. <laughs> you don't have to read those. Well, Let's see. So again, for me, I try to answer every single email. So nobody gets an automatic delete. Um, however, there are certain ones that will certainly get buried in my inbox, and I will, I will unfortunately not get back to you until later. Um, uh, and those are going to be the ones that are basically just like you mentioned. They're, they're sending a novel. You know, I, what I need is a, a, I would say eh, that much text, if you will, um, if that works, you know, since this is a video podcast as well, I, I would say about that much text is, is, is what you need to grab me with. And then you know, for audio, some, about a, a, a paragraph and a half, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would say, you know, send, send something that's got a picture, send something that's got some, some quick links to socials and, and maybe a couple of quotes, maybe, you know, maybe some stats about we've played these festivals and things like that. But to some extent, again, if I do my research properly, I'm going to look on your website and I'm going to figure out what are the, what are the places you're playing as a talent buyer, as an agent, either side of that, I'm going to look at your website and figure out what, how good does this website look? You know, is it easy to navigate? Does it have plenty of media on there? Does it have, um, does it have current contact information on there? Does it have actual dates on there for for shows and not like some kind of a random rss feed or whatever they're calling them these days you know and and, and stuff like that i want to see actual like a, a real professional website you know that, that's been made in this this day and age that between wix and squarespace and all of that they're easy to make for sure so they don't have to be like you don't have to drop thousands and thousands of dollars on it but it should be okay. something that's truly functional right you yeah. know um but but I would say like a quick a quick paragraph tops. Um, you know, build what's called a pitch. You know, if you can't grab me in thirty seconds, you don't have me. Right, I love that. And then, um, so for example, I want to throw out there is let's say there's a band in Orlando. Uh, they're based in Orlando. You have a venue in Tampa. So for mm -hmm. those that are not from Florida, that's about 70, 80 miles apart. If right. band can let's say can sell two hundred tickets in Orlando at the the social or sound bar. And it's legit. They're actually really doing that. Uh, and now they want to expand into Tampa, but have never played Tampa before. What are some things that you want to look for? And how does that band get a shot of actually playing the next town over so they can start building that uh, city? Well, exactly what you just said, though. The, the, all of that example that you just said is, is, is a lot of the things that I want to be looking for. You know, first off, do I think that they're good? You know, it, we'll talk about generalities first. Then we'll talk about maybe specifics as far as venue specific. Um, you know, are they a good band? Do I think they make sense for whatever venue we may be talking about? Um, if they're actually drawing 200 tickets in, in Orlando, chances are that, you know, if you're drawing 30, 40 tickets in, in a particular market, chances are that's very much coming from your market. If you're drawing, you know, around 200 people, chances are your friends are talking to their friends who live within an hour or so away from, from them, as well as just in general online. So you're probably going to be able to get 30, 40 people who are going to come out to a show in my potential market and I'll certainly going to take a chance on that however that has a lot to do with again then you start talking about one uh, you know is there an opportunity for you to open for someone depending on the size of the venue do you make sense if you're drawing 200 people here should you even go to Tampa and play a show on your own yet if you've never played there period maybe maybe not you know certainly find a small venue but again I would do your research on looking at those venues specifically and figuring out who else is playing there and who are the headliners who are playing there? And do you think you actually make sense at those particular venues? It's great that you want to play those venues. Everybody wants to play every venue. But be mindful of the fact that the reality is, is at the at the start, the smaller the venues are, they're a little more usually genre specific. Mm -hmm. It's as as those as that funnel gets smaller and smaller to where you go to those arenas, you know, you can go to any 10,000 cap or higher arena. And you're going to see heavy metal, pop, mm -hmm. country, you know, wrestling, whatever it may be. Everything starts to to funnel into those exact venues because those are the size of those venues. But um, but the reality is is that again, pay attention to what you're doing. If you're a rock band, don't be reaching out to the jazz club, things like that. Um, but I would be reaching out and again use that small thing that says we're drawing here, so it makes sense here. 
but again, the venue I have, since you're using Tampa as an example, the venue I have in Tampa, the attic, um, is a 133 cap room, but it's really geared more towards a high end underplay of a venue. So you've never played Tampa before. You're drawing 200 people in Orlando. Size wise, you make sense. But the reality is, is that you don't truly make sense for the attic because the attic is usually $25 tickets on the low end and they can go all the way up to $150 on tickets. Right. So if you're not selling those kind of tickets, those kind of ticket prices and stuff like that, you don't make sense for that venue, small or not. Right. You know? So again, do your research. If it wasn't an open venue that, I mean, it's, say it's a 100, 200 cap venue that is a little more diverse in genres and usually has an eight to $12 ticket. But again, Ben has never played in Tampa before, um, at least not a venue. But let's say they have, just to get into the market, they maybe played a few house shows and they may have played at a coffee house uh, just to like, get in front of people and build some, some right. things. Uh, is that something that you would look at? As a Absolutely. First, first show? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and we would certainly, even in my little 133 cap room, we would look at them as a potential opener, depending on who the headliner is, you know? Um, but again, they still got to be willing to come for that support budget and stuff like yeah. that, obviously, as well. But, um, you know, again, I think every band deserves a listen. Mm-hmm. They took the time to reach out. So, again, I get emails all day long. So, if it's that short paragraph where I can do a quick link that takes me over to your, if I can be reading my next email, and listening to your music at the same time very quickly, excuse me, then great. I now, you know, I can, I can be moving on. But if I got to read 18 letters, you know, or, or 18 pages of a letter, if you will, um, to get to the information I need, I'm certainly going to, it's going to be a while before I actually get back to you, mm-hmm. you know. What, uh, what kind of content do you like seeing in those, in those links that they send? If you want, if what type of YouTube videos you want to see or what type of, um, I guess, streaming links you like seeing? Um, certainly your socials from a standpoint of Facebook, um, Instagram, Spotify. I want to look at your actual, um, uh, you know, your actual, uh, stream plays and things, which I'm, I got a question for you in reverse. Um, so, you know, I'm, this is a question I've got. Um, it kind of drives me nuts sometimes when a band is like, we have 2 million streams Mm -hmm. like, well, okay. But you have, you have a hundred thousand you know, actual followers or even 10,000 actual followers. And you have one song that got, you know, a hundred thousand plays, another song that got 400,000 plays, one song that got, you know, 600,000 plays, whatever. And not to say that that's still not impressive that they're doing that. But if one song is from 2016, right. One song is from, you know, then, then what does that to, how does that 2 million actually affect me? You know, how do you justify saying that? I always look at how recent those releases were. So like if it's right. a release that was 2016 and has even say a million streams, but like right. the newest release that's 2020 only has 10,000 streams, then of course something happened there, right? Was that single with the million streams? Was that like something that went a little bit viral um, for, for some reason? Was there something going on in their career at that time? Like it has to be a reason why that drop is so big. Or is right. it- music not as good was there maybe a change in band members and the main writer is no longer with the band and that's why the songs aren't as good anymore um right. definitely look at that if there's older songs that have more streams versus like newer songs that don't have as many right. definitely matters to me um that's, that's like something i looked at a lot when i was at house of blues um yeah. like how long how long and how long has it been since you've released music like if you all your music has 500 streams and up or 500,000 streams and up but you haven't released anything in five years like how relevant are those numbers still today um, exactly. And then one thing I always look at too is, um, just cause you have like a ton of followers or streams, like they could be anywhere in the world, right? Could be one stream in a hundred different cities or something. Um, what I always tell artists too, uh, and it'd be great to get your input on that as a, as a buyer. I tell them, if you know, you have, say you have a hundred thousand followers and 20,000 of those are from Tampa or from a specific city you're trying to book like send a screenshot of your analytics and show them, hey, here's a screenshot from my analytics. My analytics say there's X number of people in Tampa, Charlotte, whatever, and that's why I want to play the market. Right. The, I care more about that. I don't care as much because the the streaming play, like of your song, you could have paid money to get onto an aggregator, you know, right. which certainly still means that, that that song is getting played and it's getting out there. But 
I want to see where your followers are. I want to see what, how many monthly listeners you have. I want to see what markets. And as a promoter, I have a different login, I think, than, than the general public. And I can see um, different information. Bands in Town is another resource that I use quite a bit as a talent buyer, you know, because um, I have the ability to say, okay, if I'm going to run an ad through Bands in Town, how many people can I directly hit into their actual email? And if I put your band has, has never played in Tampa before, but I can put within, you know, 60 miles, how many people, how many fans do you have? And it looks like you have, you know, 140 fans Then I'm sending those exact people, those exact 140 fans an ad that says you're coming to play in the market that they live in, you know? Um, so I would say Facebook, some bands in town information, um, Instagram, I guess I'm old, which is why I keep looking at Facebook, I guess at, at 40, almost 42 years old, that, that makes me old in this industry. Um, but, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify. Um, I absolutely look at Polestar. I use it as a grain of salt. You know, I'd look to see if you've got any analytics in there of, of any kind. Um, that's also a great resource to find out, you know, um, are, are you playing? And if you're playing, you know, are you, are you doing a big tour of your own, a headlining tour? Are you headlining, are you doing a big support tour? Right. You know, and who are you supporting and how many of those support slots are you doing and how, how big is those, are those bands and so on. So I look at, I look at all of that stuff. YouTube, um, I, I, I have certainly gotten more and more and more into YouTube um, over the past year or so in general. I don't use it to listen to music per se, like as a, as a media player, but I will go on there and look and see, you know, um, how do your videos look in general? Ideally, I'd, I would prefer to see live footage, but I don't want to see like, a cell phone camera, so to speak. Um, you know, if it's professional grade cell phone camera, I guess I'll be more than happy to look at it. But for the most part, you know, I want the sound quality to be good and stuff so I can really get a sense of what you're doing. But then I also want to, I want to look at the views of that, you know, um, you know, do you have a video that's been, you know, a perfect example is, uh, the dead South who were certainly a YouTube sensation. Um, and thank God they were not like a Justin Bieber style YouTube sensation. I actually like their music, but <laughs> You know, they came out of Canada and they've got that one video that's got like 60 million views or something like that, you know. Um, and honestly, like, I liked them. I didn't love them. But then I finally got a chance to see them live. And at that point, that's when I was like, all right, now I truly get it, you know. Um, and the video that went viral was a music video. It wasn't even a like a live footage video or anything like that, you know. So, again, it still didn't get – I had to still do research to check out that band and, you know, to really get a sense of what, what do they sound like live and such. because you can produce an album or release an album, but I find that, that, that bands should almost never sound like they do on an album when they're playing live. Right. Um, and I will say a big mistake that I'm sure you've come across is that a band will release um, an album where it sounds like there's an 11 piece band on the album <laughs> and they come and actually do the tour and they're touring in about the release of this album and they come as a three piece band. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I have a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit on, on your story. So we're talking about how you were working at the neighborhood theater, working security and health loadings and everything. How did, I guess, tell me the journey of how that, how you went from there to working at Blue Mountain Arts and becoming an agent. And like, what were you doing in between th those two points? Okay, so working for the neighborhood theater, um, I had an opportunity to work. I was doing that sort of part-time because I wasn't a full-time employee there or anything. And I actually was bartending at a golf course. Um, I was a bar manager at a golf course. And uh, for those of you who have the opportunity to go do that, you know, uh, I would highly suggest it. They usually pay very well as far as a base, base fee and then you still get tips. Um, and I was making basically $10 an hour plus tips. So little tidbit, if, if you're in college, go get a job at a golf course. Um, I was not in college at the time, but still I was making good money. And so I only had to work a couple days a week. And so I decided that I wanted to start an organization called uh, the Carolina Live Music Society, which was about bringing more people um, together in the scene. I was one of the many people who were sitting at home complaining that there wasn't as good of a music scene here in Charlotte. And it dawned on me that I'm not really allowed to complain about it unless I'm willing to try and do something about it as well. Um, so otherwise I would just need to shut up. So I was like, all right, well, I like complaining, I guess. So I'm going to get off the couch, try and do something about it. Um, and so I started a company with some friends called the Carolina Live Music Society. And the, the goal was to get one, talk to agents and bring agents through town 
uh, or I'm not, I'm sorry, not agents, bring artists through town who normally wouldn't play in town, try and get the different venues in town to start communicating with each other um, to compete less. The reality is we're always going to compete with each other, but how can we find a way to work together so there's a little less competition um, and find a way to get more involvement in the actual uh, community um, mm -hmm. where the, the, the fans themselves would have more incentive to not only go out to shows, but to truly be part of the process, build more of a street team, give a lot more incentives. You know, if you're doing more street teaming than other people, you know, all of that kind of stuff, so on and so on. So I did that for a couple of years. And through that, one of the venues that we were producing shows in was the neighborhood theater, but was also a, a place called the Double Door Inn here in Charlotte, which unfortunately is, is, is now gone. But um, uh, so I was, I was producing shows on the side in the Double Door. And the golf course at some point decided they were going to renovate the golf course. So in doing that, they knew that they weren't going to have any golfers there. So they, they laid off some of their staff, me being one of them. Um, so I went to the double, the owner of the double door, Nick Karras, um, here in Charlotte. And I, I said, why don't you let me be your actual talent buyer? You know, you don't have an actual talent buyer. Bring me on board. Let me, let me be your full-time talent buyer. Um, and I'll help you continue to grow the, the, the venue. Um, and so I worked for the Double Door Inn for about five or six years. Um, and I was their talent buyer. I helped them get a new website that actually offered online ticketing, became their marketing manager, brought on a full production a production manager full time. Um, and we started upgrading the PA and really built, bringing more and more artists through the area and stuff like that um, and helping build newer regional artists and such as well. Um, through that, I met Hugh Southard um, at Blue Mountain Artists and was already bringing a lot of his artists through the venue. People like Tab and Juan, Eric Lindell, and George Porter Jr., um, and so on. Uh, um, he had a really great American Roots roster. Um, and so he called me up one day. We had gotten to be sort of friendly, and he called, called me up one day and asked to take me to lunch. So I went out with him for lunch, and while we were at lunch, he, he said, you know, listen, I think you'd be really, really great as, as a manager. Um, and I have a management division with Blue Mountain Artists. So come and work with me and help me manage Tim Reynolds and such. And I thought that was a really cool opportunity, but it wasn't going to be enough money for me to totally walk away from the double door. And so me being a little nutty, <laughs> decided I would continue to work at the double door while working for Blue Mountain Artists. Wow. <laughs> and within about two months of working for Blue Mountain Artists, there was an agent who was going to be moving on. And so they moved me into an agent role and I worked with the, the Deep South. Um, and so I was running the double door as their talent buyer full time. And I started becoming an agent and we had the way Blue Mountain worked, at least at the time was it was territory based. So you, we ran a territory for the entire roster. So we had about 60 artists. And so I, I helped book 60 artists in a specific territory. Um, and about six months into that, Somebody called, uh, called me looking for um, an artist that we represented at the time called The New Familiars. He was interested in possibly producing a music festival, uh, in fact, a beer and music festival, and um, wanted to get some information about him. And I had some experience with production from working at the Neighborhood Theater and running the venue. And so uh, it was, I asked him if he, you know, if you need any help, let me know, blah, blah, blah. And so we decided to have lunch. Uh, the gentleman's name is uh, Jeff Fissel. And um, at that point, we decided that we should just produce the festival together. And again, here we are 10 years later, producing the North Carolina Brewers and Music Festival. Um, but uh, about, so six months into working for Blue Mountain Artists, I was doing talent buying full-time for the Double Door Inn. I was an agent for Blue Mountain, and now I was starting to produce this festival on the side. So yeah, so after about two years of doing that, something had to give. And I went ahead and gave, um, I, I put in my notice and I gave a six month notice to make sure I had somebody uh, really appropriate to take over my job at the, at the double door. Uh, it was time for me to walk away from one of those things. And uh, Greg McCraw, who had been off and on over the years producing shows in the double door in general um, here in Charlotte, he, he, I reached out to him first and, and he was totally interested in becoming their full-time talent buyer. And so um, I'm, I became just a full-time agent with Blue Mountain Artists and was producing this festival. Um, and uh, I w so I worked for the Double Door for about six years. And then there was a two-hour 
or two year overlap. And then um, after another four years, so a total of about six years working for Blue Mountain Artists, I left there to, um, to start Midwood Entertainment. And I had, it was just me and an assistant in September of 2015. I had uh, nine bands and two festivals, one in Arkansas and one in one here in, in North Carolina um, that we were commissioned to be producing. And come January, I had 13 artists, uh, January 2016, so September to January, we had 13 artists that we were handling the booking for. And then um, we, we had a concert series that we did added a concert series as well that was gonna be a six part concert series. So that's when it became clear that I was going to need to bring on more help. And that's when I started expanding the, uh, um, the, the company and Rusty Cole, who was also the head of the agency division, um, came on board as a junior agent. And then, like I said, he's now the age that he runs the, the agency division. So he's moved up certainly in the ranks and he's been one of my best friends for years, also a bass player. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I know, you know, Rusty, um, as well. He's told me to tell you hello, by the way. Oh, awesome. um, but uh, so, yeah, so here we are, you know, four and a half years later. And, uh, you know, we're like everybody else. We're still a small company. We've expanded quite a bit, but we're still a small company. And, um, you know, uh, we'll see what happens with this new COVID-19 environment situation, the coronavirus and what it does to us. So, yeah. So it's one hell of a journey. <laughs> you don't like free time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions on, on festivals and then a couple yeah. of questions. And these are not really artist related, more like people that want to put on festivals or people that want to become an agent. So this first one's a two-parter. So I'll, I'll break this up into two different parts. Um, okay. I have a lot of students. Uh, I was one of them myself at one point where we think it's just easy to put on a festival. And I always say sometimes not knowing what you should know might be good because it gives you <laughs> the courage to put the festival on. I would say if I knew what I know today, I probably would have never done Rock Ronger. Um, right. Part of like my journey. So I'm glad I was the, the stubborn college student that did put that festival on. <laughs> right. But there's quite a few students like that that want to just put on festivals. And no matter how much you discourage them, uh, they're going to try to figure out a way to do it. So I guess what's the, knowing what you know, what's the minimum amount and someone should have as like a budget to put on a small lo like local festival and what is the minimum amount of experience they should have to kind of at least maybe not do it right, but at least do it good enough to where people want to work with them again. <laughs> okay. Uh, hmm. So the minimum amount of money is a hard one. Both, both of these are sort of hard to answer a little bit. Um, I'll answer the experience aspect first. We'll okay. come back to the money in a second. <laughs> To me, um, I, I run my company currently um, and in every other project that I work on and such, whether it be a festival or it be a band we represent or whatever, my fundamental philosophy is always surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. If you were the smartest person in the room, then everybody's learning from you and you ain't learning shit. Yeah. Um, so surround yourself with people who are smarter from you so that way you can always be learning. However, don't ever expect that you can do everything on your own. So by surrounding yourself with these people who are smarter than you, you know, if you want to be a festival producer, learn about talent buying, but don't necessarily be the talent buyer. Learn about marketing, but don't be the marketer. Learn about side ops, which is the logistics of a particular, you know, piece of property that you're going to do this on, whether it be a city park or whether it be do somebody's farm out in the middle of nowhere or a, even, a, you know, blocking off a street. Um, you know, there's lots of things, artist relations, artist travel, all of these things, get some basic understanding of it by talking to people who handle those things, but hire people who know, and, and hire can be a loose term. It can certainly be volunteers and such, but find people who have experience with those avenues and bring them on board. Mm -hmm. If you have the budget to pay them, pay them. Right. Because first of all, um, they have an expertise, so there's a value to it. And, and if they are paid for those, for that expertise, then they will clearly do a better job, usually do a better job than necessarily volunteer will. And you can hold them accountable. Um, it's different. You can't hold volunteers as accountable because at the end of the day, they're still volunteers. Um, that said, uh, you know, so I would say be mindful. Don't, don't just wake up one morning and say, I want to do a festival. <laughs> Feel free to wake up and you know, or and then and then go ahead and do it. I would say wake up one morning, say I want to do a festival, and then say, all right, well, I'm going to go, 
I'm going to, where are the venues, who are the concert promoters that I know in town um, or what are the venues that I frequent often? And I'm going to go there and see if I can talk with somebody and say, Hey, I've got this idea. What are things I should be thinking about? You know, call fencing companies, call, you know, find the, uh, the other festivals that you've gone to. There's contact information that's, that's able to be found somewhere. Find a way to talk to people and, and ask questions. Don't ever, ever, ever think that you can do everything by yourself or that you already know how to do any particular thing until you've actually done it. Right. Um, from, from a financial standpoint, again, with that experience, I would say gather your team, get some sense of how much it's going to cost to afford that team, and then think about the expenses for that event. And, and it's hard to put a number on it because, you know, you may say, well, we want to do a festival with, say, Pearl Jam. Yeah. Well, Pearl Jam may be $2 million. And, you know, and then if they're $2 million, well, how much money do you have? Do you even have $2 million to pay for them? Right. You, know, um, you get a, it doesn't matter if it's a, who's $2 million or they're $1 million or $100,000 or $10,000 or even a thousand. Don't ever do anything. Do your research first. Right. Constantly, constantly, constantly do your research. Figure out what is a band potentially worth in a particular region. Mm -hmm. Be mindful of radius clauses. Radius meaning, you know, if I'm going to give you this offer to come play my festival in Orlando or Charlotte or wherever, then I, I need to protect that show. So I don't want you playing within 120 to 150 miles three months before and three months after. Right. And that's a variable. It could be hundred miles for 30 days before and 30 days after it can be 60 miles for 90 days before 90 days after that. And those numbers could vary. Um, but get some idea before you spend dollar number one, get some idea of what all of those different things are going to cost. Right. Um, and then I would say, make sure that you've got, and this doesn't happen a lot. We all know this in the music industry, but I would say don't put out a single dollar on anyone unless you've got all the money in the bank. Mm -hmm. expect that not a single person is going to buy a ticket to your event yep. that not a single sponsor is going to give you money for your event. Um, so make sure that you've got a hundred percent of your money in account because at the end of the day, good, better, ugly, you may go broke doing it. And I would go ahead and prepare yourself to be broke for the rest of your life doing it. Cause the majority of people in this industry don't make a lot of money. Right. Um, I would say you lose more money than you probably truly make over the course of an actual career. Uh, but, um, make sure that if you're going to spend even a dollar, that it's, it's money that you can afford to spend. Don't put yourself out there to a point where you have to mortgage your house, where you might lose your marriage, where you, you know, have become homeless, whatever it may be, any of those things. Don't ever put yourself at risk. If you're not prepared to lose the money, don't spend it. Right. Yeah. That, that's the one lesson I wish. I would have known. So the, first, the first rock finger didn't cost us anything because it was all, everyone volunteered. It was on UCF campus. Right. The second one probably cost around 20000 And we started a festival zero in the bank. It was the scariest six months of my life. Yeah. Every time we sold a ticket, I was like, yes, we're one step closer. But yeah, never, never ever do that. That's such great advice. Uh, you told me also a really good strategy. So like talking about like figuring out like your band budget, for example, uh, mm -hmm. you're probably going to book Curl Jam your first time doing a festival, um, and you have a small budget, right? You gave me a really great strategy one time we talked, we did a podcast for like my class at Wholesale, and you told me about a strategy where if you really want to build something that's going to be a recurring festival, you're starting small, let's say it's a, anywhere from a thirty to $50,000 budget, uh, like kind of just starting off with the, lo the bigger locals and the bigger regional bands, and then slowly building from that, like what's a good strategy in figuring out um again budgets might vary but figure out what type of talent you're booking for your festival um well so again using your tools you know um i would say if you want to truly become a concert promoter get a per a professional grade polestar account yep. um it's got an amazing it's got amazing information on it it's got contact information for for bands agents um it's it's got the ability for you to actually um this is an extra fee you have to pay for, but they have actual tour history on there where you can, you can, you can certainly look, if you have a pro account, a Pulsar pro account, you can look up um, what an average gross of, of a particular artist is on there. You know, however many gigs they do, what's the average of, of the gross, what's the average ticket sales that they do, those kind of things. Um, but then you can also buy actual tour history. So you can see this band, last time this band played in Charlotte, North Carolina, 
they did 400 hard tickets and they grossed $24,000. You know, you can see that they played in, you know, they grossed $180,000 and did 1,200 tickets or 5,000 tickets or whatever it may be. You can get hard numbers from that information. Past that, certainly pay attention to your socials. At the end of the day, if you're going to spend dollar one, what are you getting marketing wise out of that? What is the reach of that particular band? Understanding where the fans of those particular bands live. You, you, you were talking about the, 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 the market aspect from Spotify and things like that. You'd want to look at that from, from all of your analytics, you know, your Facebooks, your bands in town, those kind of things, so on and so on. Um, but again, if you, you go out to see music, you haven't just woken up one day to say, you know, I'm going to be a concert promoter, but I don't know anything. I've never been to a concert ever. <laughs> Maybe there has been somebody who did that, but I would imagine the majority of people haven't. Um, so what are the shows that you go to in your home market? You live in Orlando. What venues do you frequent? Okay. You're going to go to the social, you're going to go to the Plaza, you're going to go to Will's pub, wherever it may be. What are the bands that are playing at those places that you go to see? How many people are there? You know, when you, when, when you go to see, uh, the orange, is the orange, the orange constant, right? They're from Orlando. Is that right? I haven't heard them. Maybe. No. Okay. Maybe not. Um, anyway, you pick a band from Orlando and when you go see them, they're playing the first time you saw them, the first three times you saw them, they play Will's pub, which is a smaller room. Now you're going to see them. They're playing the social, which is a bigger room. And now, and they're, and they're selling that place out. And now all of a sudden you're going to see them now, now playing the plaza. Well, now you have some kind of a sense of what does that band actually draw? You know, they're selling out the plaza, which is, I think, seven or 800 cap, if I remember correctly. Um, understanding those things uh, from a local standpoint, because at the end of the day, the, re the majority of the people you're going to pull for your event are from your local market. Um, so making sure that you have a contingency of local artists who are from there. That said, you also need to be mindful of how many unique ticket buyers are you actually marketing this to? If you get four ska bands, how many of those ska, if you've got your headliner and you've got the three undercards, how many want, how many of those fans who are going to buy a ticket for the undercard are already buying it because of the headliner? Right. Yep. So the reality is, is you want to build, I mean, you want to be mindful of that, but you, chances are your top, depending on the size of your festival, your top, I would say two to 12 bands are what's really selling you tickets, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but understanding your local market, you know, paying attention to the venues that you go to, to the bands that you see playing at those venues, to how many tickets they're selling, those kind of things. Yeah, those are really good tips. So now I'm going over to the, the agency side. Um, yeah. How does someone become an agent? And what are maybe the benefits of, <laughs> what are the benefits of maybe starting at a boutique agency versus like, going to one of the major agencies? Um, well, uh, how does one become an agent? Uh, well, let's take that step back a little bit. How does one decide to be in this industry for a living? First of all, <laughs> realize that you're obviously crazy. Yep. Um, Probably go to therapy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, the How does somebody become an agent? Somebody becomes an agent usually because, I, I think, because they, they certainly love music and they have found that there's a vacuum that needs to be filled with any particular band that they're, they happen to have some kind of relationship with, you know, um, uh, usually it starts on some level of the local, whether you become a promoter first and then all of a sudden a band is like, we don't have an agent. We love you. And we have a great relationship with you and we hang out with you all the time. Could you start making some phone calls for us? Um, I mean, for me, like I said, I was a promoter first and I had an agency that I was promoting shows from, um, who reached out and said, did we think you'd be a good fit? Um, the uh, how, at the end of the day, it's a sales job. So if you're not, if you if you don't have very good social skills, if you don't really like talking to people, if you're much more of an introvert and such, it's not the industry for you. Not to say that you can't do it, but fundamentally, it's not really the the, the industry for you. You need to be able to be somebody who is really great with people skills, doesn't mind doing cold calling, um, to some extent has no shame. Um, you know. Um, and, and again, being passionate about an artist, right. you know, trying to help them develop their career and really understanding what are the scopes, willing to do the research of how do I build this band? What are, where are other bands playing like this? So on and so on. Um, 
Awesome. The benefit of doing it with a boutique agency, especially if you're the person who starts it, so that you can do it the way you want to do it and at whatever pace you want to do it. Um, I worked for a boutique agency before I started this company. Mm-hmm. And the biggest reason why I left that other company to do it, to, to start this one is because I wanted to start doing it my way, you right. know, and not that what was happening at the other agency wasn't necessarily being done right or being done well or anything like that. It just came down to, at the end of the day, I wanted to be my own boss. I didn't want to have to answer to somebody else. Um, of course I have staff who have to answer to me and I have to, you know, be there for and things like that too. But, um, you get to do it your own way. Fundamentally, working for those bigger agencies is something that a lot of people want to do because they're, it should be adding some sense of security, job security and things like that and leverage, mm-hmm. you know, job security from the standpoint of you're working for this big machine and there's some corporate aspect and they should be able to, to be okay, no matter what kind of downturn in the economy there may be and so on. Not to mention the fact that because there's such a machine that you get leverage from that. Hey, I am so-and-so at, Midwood Entertainment versus I am so-and-so at Paradigm or William Morris. There's clout that 100%, not, and I'm not saying that to, to take anything away from Midwood Entertainment. I'm using this example because we're a boutique agency, but, you know, and we have, I would like to feel after four and a half years, we have some clout out there for sure. But, you know, if I had Paradigm in my email, people are going to answer, talent buyers are going to answer your, your, um, your phone call. They're going to answer your email much faster and things like that because that's usually where the majority of the bigger bands are. Um, that said, I think a boutique agency is, it, we're gonna see more of those coming out of coronavirus anyway. Um, but I think that's where you can truly, there's a lot of really amazingly talented agents at some of those bigger agencies who absolutely still take the time to truly um, develop their artists properly. I think when you are with a boutique agency, the biggest mistake that you'll have is to have too big of a roster where you can't dedicate enough time to any particular artist. Mm-hmm. Um, you should make sure that you have time to, to help strategize and be on phone calls when that artist needs you to be on phone calls and, and, and take time to, to truly build a strategy. Um, I think fundamentally you have a lot of the same philosophies though, depending on which, whether you're at a big agency or a small agency. Mm-hmm. How does someone start an agency? So one of the common misconceptions I get from, from artists is there's two different ones. One is that they just need to find a manager so they can book shows for them when managers technically can't book shows, especially in certain states. Um, and then the other common misconception is, oh, all I need is an agent and then I'll start playing shows where getting an agent, I think these days, is almost just as hard, if not sometimes harder than getting a record deal. Um, right. So I guess what are the parameters of starting an agency? What, you need any kind of licenses? Does it differ by state? It is, it is different by state, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, I think California is the only state that you are actually required to have some kind of an actual agency license, so to speak. Um, um, it's, it's for in California is for if you want to just book one band. Um, Florida, yeah. actually, it's a requirement as well, but okay. if, only if you're going to book more than like one artist. So you could be a manager and book an artist, but if it's going to be more than one, then you have to have an agency license. Okay. In and the state of North Carolina. Which is crazy. Yeah. I never heard of anybody getting arrested for booking bands, but it's technically considered a felony. If you- okay. Um, in North Carolina, uh, you don't have to have that. Um, when I started a company, the first things I did was say, all right, well, what are the things that I know I'm going to need? I'm going to need a lawyer. I'm going to need a, an accountant. Um, and I'm going to need insurance, you know, um, a lawyer, you know, a lawyer or an accountant can help you start your LLC, um, which 100% make sure that you get an LLC. And I don't care if you're working with one artist or you're working with, um, with a lot of artists, you know, or if you're a band manager, or even if you're a band, if you're a band, get an LLC, start an, a, a business. Um, but a lot of that can also protect you from a standpoint of personal liability versus professional liability by starting a company. Um, but, you know, again, going back to the fact that you can't do everything yourself. In order for me to run my business, I need to be able to have people who can truly take care of the things that I don't have any expertise in. I'm not a lawyer, nor will I ever be a lawyer. Um, so I have a lawyer. And I got specifically an entertainment lawyer. And he's an amazing entertainment lawyer. He is a guy named Matt Wilson based out of Atlanta. 
Um, he's a good friend of mine and, and he has been extremely, extremely, um, helpful and he's taken great care of me and great care of our clients and such. Um, and he works with festivals as well as bands and such. Um, uh, there's a small accounting firm here based in Charlotte, um, that we work with that handles all of our accounting. We don't have an in-house counsel from that standpoint. Um, we have an accountant firm that, that does that. Um, you know, and, but we have an insurance agent and he handles all of our insurance, whether it be general liability insurance, workman's comp, or whether it be actual invent insurance. Right. And I have somebody, and, and, oh, and a banker. Mm -hmm. Definitely want to have a banker. That's different from an accountant. Um, and, and where that really shines is in exact situations that we're going through now. I have a direct line to a, a person who handles all of my finances at a bank. Um, and so he walks me through all the loan process for all of the government grants and things like this and so on. And anytime I have a question, I can just pick up the phone and call him. Mm -hmm. And having a relationship with a small business banker makes a huge difference um, in making sure that I have the resources that I need for those kind of things. Um, but you want to get an LLC, you want to get insurance, you know, I would say those are your fundamentals. You don't need an office. Let's go ahead and, 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 and take care of that misnomer right now. Um, I have, again, we've been in business for four and a half years. Almost every single one of my employees works from home. Um, in fact, every one of them works from home. It's not almost, um, every single one of them works from home. Um, and they all work remote. We have, I have an employee who works in, who lives in Pennsylvania, one who lives in Virginia, one who lives in South Carolina and everybody else lives uh, pretty much right here in Charlotte. And when we need to have some kind of a meeting, we either do a phone call or we all get together at somebody's house. Right. You know, um, Certainly, we have an office line. You can do Vonage business. Everybody has an office line, and it goes directly to people's cell phones and stuff like that. So you don't need an actual physical office. Right. Um, everybody can work remote these days. So. so let's say someone wanted to become an agent, but I don't know, maybe they have some experience in the industry already, or for some reason going through the mail room doesn't sound exciting to them, and they don't want to go work at a venue because they just really just want to be an agent. So they right. build up a small roster of five to eight artists that are hoping to bring on to an agency down the road. Um, what do you look for in maybe that person? And so what's the most parameters that you have for, for artists? Do you look at their, their entire roster? Like do all eight of their artists need to fit those parameters? Um, like how could someone bring their roster to, to an agency like yours or even any agency? Okay. So I would imagine other agencies are different. Every agency is going to be a little different on this. Um, fundamentally we are, I would say still an American roots, you know, roster. Um, I don't see us working, not that we don't love it from a standpoint of as music fans and such, but don't see us ever really representing any heavy metal or hard rock. I don't see us representing anything like, you know, hip hop or rap or anything like that. And, and again, it's not because we don't like the music. It's just not necessarily what truly fits in the wheelhouse of this, of the direction of this company. Um, ironically, even from an event standpoint, if you look at the majority of our events, our events live more inside of the Americana, you know, country bluegrass world than they do anything else. As a true music fan, though, I love all genres of music. You know, I come from a world of Tower of Power and, um, you know, Chicago and Kenny Loggins and um, Earth, Wind and Fire and stuff like that. Like, you know, amazing soul with horns and all of this. And still the majority of the events we do are very Americana based. You know, it's just sort of where we're, where we're at. And, and I love all that. And we're, I feel like we're, we're very much experts on that, those things as well. But so certainly be mindful if you're an agent and you're looking to join a bigger agency or join a agency, whatever, um, be mindful of the rosters that you're looking at. You know, if you're a heavy metal agent, don't talk to a bluegrass agency, talk to another metal agency and so on. But um, we don't have, I, I don't believe in quotas um, from a standpoint of like sales and things like that. If you're a self-motivated person, then you should be able to make the money you, you, you choose to make, you know? Um, um, you know, so if you are somebody who's hardworking, if your personality works with us, if we think your bands are a good fit, then absolutely we're, we're going to be willing to have a conversation, you know? Um, at the end of the day, like I said, it's up to you to produce. So, um, you know, we have, if you're, if you're out there by yourself and you're, you're a solo agent and you're sort of doing everything on your own, then joining an outfit like ours or a bigger one, Paradigm, whatever, again, they have lawyers, they have bankers, right. you know, those kind of companies. There's more infrastructure. Absolutely. Um, you talked about developing artists as well uh, mm -hmm. that you work with. What kind of 
artist development does an agent do? Do all of your artists have managers or does the amount of artist development depend on if they have a manager or not? Like what does artist development mean from an agency standpoint? Um, it's certainly easier if a band has a manager from as an agent. It's easier if, they're ha if they have a manager because a, a, a manager's job is to do exactly that, which is manage an artist's career. Um, there's very few artists out there who truly, again, act as, um, as, as businesses. Um, and there's a lot of them that don't understand the business aspect of it. So having a manager makes it easier because they have different connections out in the world that the agent may or may not have. They certainly have different connections out in the world that the bands may not have. Um, and so it just adds more to that team. If I know that there's a publicist as an agent, it's also something that I can sell. You know, we have an artist um, who is a, a small emerging artist um, and uh, they happen to be represented by one of the, uh, I would say fastest growing artists in the country at the moment. And I'm not going to, go into names and all of that, you know, because that, that's not what we're talking about here. But having the ability to go as an agent, having the ability to call a buyer and say, this particular artist um, is represented by this particular management company who also manages this other artist, right. says something to that talent buyer. Oh, yeah. You know, um, so those things are certainly assets, but they're not 100% necessary. They're beneficial, but they're not 100% necessary. Not at our level necessarily. Right. Um, you know, at a boutique level, any good agent at any level should have the ability to truly build a strategy, a touring strategy for the artist and discuss that with the, with, with the manager. And for the most part, be able to let off the leash and go implement the strategy that they've actually developed. Um, a lot of times managers and bands will, or managers and, and agents will develop that strategy on their own and the bands just show up and play shows and, and, and that kind of stuff. But, um, an, an agent should truly understand how to tour a band, whether there's a manager there or not. They should understand what festivals they should be playing, the timing of when that festival starts doing its buying, the clubs in the region around that festival in order to help build a route and stuff like that. That's an agent's job in general. So they should be able to build a touring strategy on their own without a manager. But again, having a manager helps, but it's not a necessity at our level. Do you have any tips or advice on, on time management. So obviously you wear a lot of hats. Uh, so I don't know if you have any what, things that help you keep organized, but in general, people in the music industry tend to wear a lot of hats. Uh, even artists or managers, they're doing many different things, especially when it's an artist that's just starting out. Do you have any kind of favorite time management hacks? Um, sure. For one, uh, anything you can get done in two minutes, do it right now. Um, you know, uh, if it's something that's going to take you longer, I don't want to. I don't want to try and say it's okay to push things off down the line and 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 procrastinate. But um, at the end of the day, you know, get things off your desk as fast as they possibly can. Don't let things sit on your desk and just pile up. That's when things really, 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 truly get bogged down. Um, uh, I would also say, from a time management standpoint, don't get bogged down in the minutia of a lot of things. Um, you know, there's a lot of drama in the world, period. Um, not all of it needs to be talked about by everybody. You know, um, I would say stay out of as much of it as you possibly can. Um, and from a, from a, going back to more of a, a, a an agent strategy or even a, a buying strategy or whatever, you know, set goals, stick to those goals, move on. Um, you know, if you're, if you are putting a tour together and you've got all but one date, and you keep talking to this one buyer in this one market and you can't get him to give you an offer no matter what. He keeps saying he's going to, but he hasn't yet. Move on. At the end of the day, you work for the, the agent. Now, I mean, you work for the artist. You certainly want to be able to have a relationship with those buyers and those promoters and those presenters because without that relationship, you know, you got nothing to some extent. But at the end of the day, you represent your, your artist. And so don't get bogged down in the things that look like they're going to take forever. You know, um, be mindful of expiration dates on offers that are coming in. Don't let those things drag out, you know, um, and be mindful about the opportunities, right? You know, leave space for opportunities. The most powerful word in, in the world is the word no. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to turn down things that you ultimately don't and shouldn't be doing, you know, 
Um, you may get a festival offer for uh, a huge festival, but you're playing on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. on you know the stage out by the stables or something like that. And you know the festival started on Thursday, and it's a camping festival. Ain't nobody paying attention to your set, right? You know, so even though you get to have that name of that festival on your website, maybe it makes sense to say no. You live on the East Coast, you get a, a good festival offer for the West Coast, but you've never played west of the Mississippi. What is your strategy about going to do it? Yeah, it, maybe it's a decent offer. Maybe you can afford to fly out there, but even then, when are you going to get back out there again? You know, understanding the strategies on when does it make sense to to continue to to to, to pursue something versus just going ahead and saying thanks so much for the opportunity, but we don't think this is going to make sense for us right now. Right. You know. Awesome. Um, so. a question I meant to ask you earlier when we we're talking about um, like just artists and touring strategy and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so of course you can't like really create cookie cutters or blueprints like this is the way you got to do it every time um but like as an educator you try to create those things to kind of create some kind of guidelines uh um, right. and those rules can always be broken so i have two rules when it comes to a band like wanting to book a venue like book a show the first one is the 50 percent rule so you should never reach out to a venue unless you can fill 50 percent of the venue's capacity um yeah. and the reason for that rule is if you want to book that venue again and want those buyers to respond to you again down the road, um, if you fill at least 50% of the venue, the likelihood is very high. And then the opposite rule that I have is, ideally, you're it's the 120% rule, so you're looking for venues that you know you can sell out and even turn some people away, because that's how you can build the demand up for your band in the market. So even though you play a coffee house that holds 50 people, um, and there's a venue that holds 100, but you know you can only sell 70, you play at a coffee house, turn some people away, just so we can say you, know, you sold out a show um, and kind of create a little bit of a buzz and people saying we couldn't get in. Um, and then you have to you know, sold out show on, on all your socials. Like nobody's gonna say, oh, well, you just played a coffee shop. People are gonna say, wow, you sold out a show. Um, right. So what your kind of thoughts on those two parameters? Well, the first parameter, ironically, I hadn't thought about, and I think it's a really, really good one. Um, so uh, I'm going to actually borrow that from from you and and tell that to my agents um, because I think that's a great 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 philosophy. I mean, certainly we like I mean like we said we we have a general philosophy of don't go after venues that don't make sense for you to be playing in, you know. But actually, truly putting a sort of parameter, a percentage parameter, like what you're talking about, you know, fifty percent. If you don't think you can fill it, at least fifty percent don't be playing it i think that's a good a good concept and that's actually um, a package too so if you bring in two bands right and, you know, it's a 200 cap venue one band can sell 80 and the other band sells 40 then yeah that's 50 percent as the package exactly um so uh, so i think that's a great one and i'm going to borrow that from you um on the other side of it that's a philosophy that i believe in all the time it's one of the reasons why i think our venue in in, in tampa is so successful as well is because um, they're underplays. And so the majority of the shows actually sell out every now and then they don't, but the majority of them do very well. Um, and I would rather have sold out on the door and turning people away because that's what not only builds the buzz for the venue, but it builds the buzz for the bands. And, and clearly that's a question you were asking more for, for the bands themselves. But, um, I would, if, if, if it's a question of playing to a half full house or selling out a show, you want to have sold out on the door every time. Absolutely. You know, so I agree with that philosophy for sure. Awesome. Um, have you have any, have any thoughts? So like, you know, Ryan Murphy, right? That, um, it's an Austin amphitheater and it's now doing Huntsville amphitheater. I don't know if I know him or not. No? Um, so, so he has on podcast. Oh, he was supposed to be on, he was supposed to be on that call that we had last week and, yeah. and he was not. Yeah. Um, you know, a family thing, but so he, he was on the podcast and he has a little bit more of a, a punk rock mentality. Um, so I kind of shared that philosophy with him. And he said, yeah, if I can um, find a venue that holds enough people, uh, I'm just going to find someone's house or garage or a parking lot of a Mexican restaurant or something that <laughs> I'm going to play a show in before I go to the venue. Um, so this is something interesting he got. And this, you know, there's a lot of artists that have played, uh, made a lot of money doing house concerts. There's an artist named Shannon Curtis that does exclusively house concerts and does you know, 70 to 80 grand a year just playing in people's houses. Um, right. Have you seen any success with artists playing house concerts or I guess alternative style venues like, like people's garages or a parking lot instead of proper venues? Um, I, uh, 
I, I have. Um, there is, I think, an entire circuit of um, house concerts out there. I know that there are, are um, there's a gentleman up in Canada named uh, um, Leonard. He's a friend of mine who he literally, he, he has a talent buying company that literally just does that. He literally will help a band put a whole tour together. It's not an agency. Right. It's, it's a talent buying company and he, he hosts house concerts all throughout Canada. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, and I know that there's, there's a, a group of people, I think down in Texas who I have not talked to in a while, so I can't remember exactly who they are, but, but I think they've put a circuit uh, together of house concerts down in, in, in the Texas area. Um, so I absolutely think that they can do that. There's a friend of mine, um, Lauren Melody, who lives in the Baltimore area who is more of a punk rock um, and heavy metal promoter. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I met her before she was actually a promoter at all. And uh, I was at a conference in Asheville a couple of years ago and she showed up and it was me and a couple other buyers on a panel. And, and she asked the question, how, do, how would a promoter start to become, how would somebody who wants to be a promoter start to become a promoter? And you sort of asked that question earlier, you know, and I, I of course advised on a lot of, you know, don't do it unless you have the money to say whatever. But at the end of the day, what we told her was start being a promoter, you know, put your money where your mouth is, right. call it, find a, find a space, call a, uh, a, a, an agent, book their band, right. you know, now you're a promoter. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really have to be any more complicated than that. And, but when, when I see all of her footage on like Instagram and stuff like that, it always looks like it's, it's a, it's a makeshift warehouse. Yeah. Um, they never look like they're in, they're in like, restaurants or anything like that but it always looks like it's in a place where you could you could literally flog everybody inside of the uh inside of the mosh pit and it would be totally fine you know um so uh i think the mentality is different depending on the genre you're looking for and and you know this guy ryan that you're talking about i don't know him and i don't i don't really know much about the venues he's playing or he's promoting in so so maybe that's not exactly the right way to say it. Cause it sounds like he's got some good rooms and such, but, um, I, I would say if you, the real winners in this world are the people who, who can find a vacuum and figure out how to fill it, yep. you know? So if you see a way that you can take bands and, and, and give them an opportunity to tour and make a living and you can make a living doing it as well, then you're already one, mm -hmm. you know, to me, this, this agency making in the music industry, is not about making millions of dollars and sell, selling millions of records. It's literally being able to wake up every morning and say, you know, I'm, I make a living of any kind, you know, um, in this industry. I pay my bills with this industry. So my last question on every podcast is what's your definition of making it? And you can't answer it before we get to the last question. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just go back and edit that. Just, just edit it to afterwards. <laughs> well, I have a, uh, a few quick, like rapid fire fun questions, but okay. before we get to those, um, I was wanting to just kind of share a story. I'm, I'm assuming I know which festival you're going to talk about, but um, of course, all the festivals you work with are your favorite festivals and you love them all equally. But <laughs> tell me about the story about maybe a festival you're most proud of or where you're most proud of, of the growth you've seen and kind of share that story and how that festival has progressed. Um, well, the North Carolina Brewers and Music Festival is probably the one I'm truly most proud of because I'm one of the owners. You know, um, it's the only festival an event that I'm a part of where I actually have a financial stake in it and such. And so it's certainly hard not to say, um, it, like you said, I love all of my festivals um, extremely uh, as much as anybody can love a festival. You know, I, I love them all very deeply. Um, um, but I would say the one that I'm truly most proud of is the North Carolina Birds and Music Festival. It's my first one that I ever produced professionally. Um, and again, this year would have been year 10. So next year will be year 10 since we're skipping this year, obviously, but, um, and, and it's hard not to be proud of a festival that's been around for 10 years and it certainly had its ups and downs. You know, we've had years where last year in particular, we were basically rained out, you know, um, and, and could barely produce the festival altogether. Um, the first year we did the festival, uh, you know, we, we, had, we used a truck bed for the stage and we put a tent over top of it. And I remember it was raining so bad. Again, it was our first year, learned a lot, you know, but it was our first year and we put a tent over top of it. And I remember having to, and it was a big, it was a big like erected tent kind of thing, but we figured out how to lower it as it was raining. And to the point where you could barely even see the band's knees, 
you know, out front because we were trying to protect them and stuff like that. You know, again, it, it wasn't the right thing to do. Clearly, we should just gotten everybody off the stage. But, you know, we learned a lot on that. And and the load in and load out on that particular event, it's on a, it's on a farm and it is you're loading in and up and down on a on a hill like that. And um, and you're doing it with golf carts because you can't get vehicles down in there and stuff um, and such. And so um, it, Eric Lindell was one of the people who was playing it and it had been raining all day, just pouring all day long. And he, for whatever reason, was wearing nothing but white, white jeans, white <laughs> shirt and everything. And we were getting up to the top of the hill, you know, loading him out. And the wheels started to spin in the golf cart and he hopped out and got right behind it and started pushing covered in mud all of a sudden you know start pushing and stuff so i mean you know there's a lot of an, an incredible memories you know we we've had um green sky bluegrass on the festival we've had the steve can rangers on it a few times infamous string dusters on it a few times leftover salmon um mandolin orange mipso um big daddy love you know yarn so on and so on over the years acoustic syndicate and all of these people have become very family to us um, uh, Steve Cain Rangers have played it more than anybody else, or as of this year would have played it more than anybody else in general, this would have been their third year, uh, headlining the festival. So they're going to headline it again next year instead. Um, I would say that that's the one that I'm, I'm truly deep down in my heart, the most attached to and proud of the one that I would say comes a very, very close second to it, um, is my favorite festival I've ever gone to, mm -hmm. which is the Bristol Rhythm and Roots Reunion. Um, and maybe that's one you were going to, I don't know which one you thought I was going to talk uh, about or not. I mentioned one you just said, because you've been yeah. working uh, for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I've been going to the Bristol Rhythm and Roots Reunion. Here we go. <laughs> for, um, yeah, for uh, um, going on, this would have been, or, or this will be my ninth year. Um, we are producing the festival in, in September, and this, this will be my ninth year attending it but it'll be my first year as the actual talent buyer of the, of the festival. And it's my favorite festival, in the, you know, that I've ever been to. Um, and I love the people I've gotten to know them all so well over the years. Um, and it's a lineup one. I, I'm, I'm sort of floored. I'm probably more emotional about it than I am other festivals um, in general, because I've been such a fan as a patron going to the festival, whether we as an agency have had bands on it, or not, I've always gone to the festival. Um, and it, it happens to also fall on this, the anniversary of my company. So um, years ago, when I was starting the company, I, I put in my two weeks notice um, with Blue Mountain Artists, and uh, which they didn't take me up on. Um, and so uh, that was on a Thursday. And that Friday, I got in the car, I was already planning on going in, that Friday, I got in the car and I spent my, my first unemployed weekend and my last unemployed weekend um, <laughs> celebrating with 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 all the folks at, at, at the Bristol Rhythm and Reunion. So here I am after all of these years um, and I'm helping procure the talent for it. And I'm extremely proud. It's 120 bands. It's a huge endeavor um, and uh, 16 stages and such. And it's it, uh, learned an immense amount doing it. Um, and I can't wait to, to produce the festival this year. Hopefully <laughs> still. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I would say those are the two that are, that I'm truly, truly the most proud of, you That's know, cool. Cool yeah. um, what do you feel? So like festivals, like a good festival is like about creating like more of an experience for the audience that's coming to the festival. Besides the music, um, do you pay attention to kind of the conversation people are having on social media? And if so, what are some things that you think people enjoy the most about going to festivals? Um, well, I mean, you have to absolutely pay attention to all of that stuff. The reality is, is I'm already at the festival, you know, um, and I'm certainly not procuring this for me, for my enjoyment. You know, I'm not, I'm not looking at the experience of the event for my own sake. It absolutely has to be thought about for all of the people who are, who are buying tickets. Um, you know, every experience is different. One of the, one of my favorite from an experiential standpoint, one of my favorite festivals or, or concert series that we produce is the is the uh, the Beach Mountain Summer Concert Series at Beach Mountain Ski Resort in in Beach Mountain, North Carolina, which is just outside of it. Um, and uh, in the summer, there's obviously no snow, 
And so we literally take over a ski slope and turn it into a natural amphitheater. And we bring a stage wow. at the bottom of it. And we basically literally create an experience. Um, and it's amazing to watch people react to it because for one, it being in the mountains, it could literally be 90 degrees here in Charlotte and it'll be 70 degrees up there. Wow. And at night, it'll get down into the 40s. You know, so it, it's it's in the middle of the summer and you have this amazing experience in the beautiful mountains and the, you know, open air and all of this stuff. And and, and we absolutely pay attention to the feedback that we get from that um, and and try and be mindful of, of, of how we use that information. Um, every year after we do any particular event, we, we uh, you know, one of the first things we do is we reach out and, and ask people, you know, for feedback, for sure. We usually send that to ticket buyers specifically who, who came the year past. Um, but then we also reach out to the general public through like Facebook and Instagram and things like that and say, who do you want to see for next year? Who was your favorite artist this year? Who do you want to see invited back? Who, who haven't, who has never played it if you've been coming to it for years and who would you like to see? Um, because at the end of the day, it's an experience for them. You know, now that's strictly about music, but then we also talk about how do we, you know, how do you schedule out the different stages so people have an opportunity to see different things? How do you um, look at a, a site layout and think about the overall experience? There's a festival we do down in Florida called the Orange Blossom Review, which is in Lake Wales, um, where we did it the first time this past year. And we went down there and did a site walk and met the people, the clients and stuff. And they said, here's our layout. Here's our site map. And they walked us through the site map and stuff. And when they were done doing it, we were in the park. And when they were done doing it, they said, if none of this was like this, how would you do it? Mm -hmm. And I immediately said, oh, well, I would move the stage from here to over here because you've got these trees in this area and it creates this beautiful grove experience. Mm -hmm. You can hang lights from the trees, which creates different ambiance and all of those kind of things. And it's a simple thought, yeah. but it changes the entire vibe. And yeah. they were floored. And so we did all of that. We moved everything around and so on and changed the layout. And the, the experience from not only the patrons, but bands who had played the festival in the past who were coming back, um, everybody, you know, thought it was a much better experience in general. And uh, the sound company was much happier with it because you, it was on a lake. Right. And we weren't getting where the stage originally was. You were going to get wind and stuff off of the lake and you weren't going to get it from the new place and things like that. So it's, you know, looking at all of the different levels of it. Yeah, love it. Um, all right, so a few last fun, uh, quick questions. Okay. So first one is, what's the most common bad advice you um, hear people give in our industry? Ooh, bad advice. Uh, huh. Um, bad advice. Uh, well, bad advice, I would say, is, is uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> like going into anything and not having a plan and just saying, we'll figure it out. We're going to make yeah. it work. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, I would say that that is, that is bad advice. Have a plan. Yeah. Um, and, and then have two, two contingency plans to back that, that uh, plan. A definitely have a plan B and C just in case. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, I, that, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> that's a good one. Though. I've been to so many meetings where people said, hey, I'll figure it out. We'll come up with a plan. And I, well, what is the plan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm having yeah, to get back here. <laughs> yeah, like th th there's got to be a baseline here where we're going to do something, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, again, may, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question very effectively. Uh, I go back to my earlier statement of surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. So I feel like um, by me doing that, I'm constantly learning before I make a mistake. And I've certainly made some. But before I make a mistake, I have an opportunity to try and go ahead and do it right the first time mm -hmm. by surrounding myself with people who know what they're doing. And the opposite of that, what's the best advice you've ever gotten? Uh, take all the emotion out of it. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Uh, um, this, is, this is not an emotional industry. This is a, it's, it's a job for one. It's not personal. Um, and at the end of the day, music is a very personal and emotional thing. And I can't make decisions based off of my emotions from that standpoint. You know, I need to think about the repercussions of any particular decision. So take the emotions out of it. That's a good one. It's a real good one. Um, when you think of the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? What's the first person that comes to mind when I think of the word successful? Um, 
my father, I would say, um, who, uh, granted, he's a third, third generation um, men's clothier in Virginia. Um, I, I would say he's 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 taught me a lot about how to think outside the box, and uh, um, and and think about from a business standpoint, I would say my, my, my father is the first thing that comes to mind when I think about the word successful. Um, from a life standpoint, I would say my friend Tony Altora is probably the one because he is, he's probably the first person to, to really truly be able to reel me in from a, a Zen standpoint, you know, give, he's, he's really taught me how to look differently at the world. Um, just in general you know, not, not, not to, not to react quite as quickly to things and sort of take a step back. Um, tell me about your first concert experience or your first memorable concert experience. Okay. So my first concert experience is a two is, is two separate concerts, but they were, they were still my first concert experience. Um, (laughs) or that I truly remember anyway. Um, uh, my parents took me on one night to see the Moody Blues in Roanoke, Virginia play with the symphony. And the very next night, or the very next morning, me and some friends squeezed into a Fiat convertible spider and drove to uh, Manassas, Virginia and saw fish for the first time. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so, and and fish, I mean, that's a huge contrast between Moody Blues and fish, for sure. But at that show, for fish specifically, and he and I were just talking about this the other day online, but, we got it. We got into the show. We had lawn seats, and for whatever reason, it's the first time I'm aware of that fish started early, uh-huh. and there was nobody was in their seats, mm-hmm. and there was a shit ton of people on the lawn. So somehow we all looked at each other, and literally, you know, thousands of people all looked at each other and knew the exact same thing, and at once we all became a huge wave and scaled the walls to actually get down into the seats, uh-huh. and um, I ended up ten rows back. Um, for my very first fish show so yeah what is something that you're currently really interested in or into so it doesn't have to be music related at all there's plenty of downtime right now are there any guilty pleasure tv shows or apps or it could be an artist exercise food whatever what's something you're currently really interested in okay uh well um aspen and i aspen is my is my uh is my partner um going on over 12 years now but she and I are during this time. Um, we are going to learn about landscape design and and change our backyard. We have a huge backyard, and we're going to change it and, and and really landscape it up, and maybe put some plants, not plants, maybe put some ponds, and get some fish and stuff like that, and learn how to do that properly, and also uh, look at um, uh, just how to make it feel more structurally overgrown so it adds a little bit more of a wild aspect to it but it's done with purpose Mm -hmm. um my guilty pleasure from a standpoint of show it's always my go-to if i can't find anything else to watch west wing i will watch that 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 whole series over and over and over and over and over and over and over again that's awesome that's us with the office (laughs) in terms of uh landscaping i'll definitely and then we've talked about this but i'll definitely have to pick your brain because I have a cilantro standing here next to me that <laughs> didn't even make it two weeks. <laughs> oh, me. you don't want to pick my, I don't have a green thumb. <laughs> we're going to probably kill everything that's back there, but we're going to learn about it anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, what are books, documentaries, or podcasts you share the most? Uh, okay, books. And I don't, re- I, I read everything I can get my hands on by Greg Hurwitz. He's a great fiction writer. Um, He's incredible. Uh, love, love listening to him. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't read a lot of like educational books, so to speak, about how to improve myself as a person. Um, I know I should, because there's lots of improvement to be done, but I, it's just not who I am. Um, podcast, I would say my two favorite podcasts are um, How Did This Get Made, which is, I think we talked about that the other day. It's a, uh, it's, it's um, a few comedians, Paul Shear, Jason Manzukis, and uh, June, Diane, Raphael, who sometimes have special guests and such, but they're basically just totally making fun of really, really, really shitty movies. And it's amazingly funny. Um, the other one I love listening to is Criminal. I just love hearing the history. And, and it's not, 
it's 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 not always about true like crime or the person who committed the crime or anything like that. There's just a lot of interesting, strange stories that that come out of it, um, and I just love listening to it. Awesome. And before I ask you the last question, is I just want to say thank you for for taking the time and doing this podcast. Thanks for being an awesome friend and someone I've learned from a lot over the years. Uh, and just thanks for all the, the lessons you shared today. I think this was really fun. I think there's a lot of really good lessons, and especially coming from an agent promoter standpoint, they're giving some real tangible things that people can set as goals versus just saying, just have good music or a good live show. Like, of course that is the obvious, but that's like very vague. And it's great that you give so many good lessons where I think people can take, uh, have a lot of takeaways from this. So thanks for sharing and for yeah, being a good friend. Thanks. Thank you very much for being a good friend of mine as well. And thanks for uh, allowing me to finally be on your podcast. been listening to it for years. So, you know, it's a pretty big honor to actually be on it. Ah, you know, it's a big honor to have you on here. And then the question I asked at the end that you already answered, <laughs> you answered differently. What's your definition of making it? Um, waking up every morning and just making sure that you, waking up every morning and going to sleep every night, making sure that, that you, you are happy and love everything that you're doing. You know, um, reminding yourself every day that you don't have to do the things you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I think that can be taken exactly how that is very literal, you know, um, do the things that fill your heart with, spend, spend your life filling your heart with as much joy and as much of your time with as much joy and happiness as possible. Surround yourself with people that elevate you as humans um, and, uh, and, and give you as much inspiration to try and be the same in return to other people and into your community. To me, I don't mean to get all philosophical about it, but to me, that is, that is the sign of making it, is being able to wake up every morning doing what you love um, and inspiring other people to do the same.